Thanks. Um, so yeah, so my name is Matt Wallace. Uh, I am here as a co-director and co-founder of Make Monmouth, which is really quite a scary thing to say because I've been on stage many times, but never in this particular role. So here we go. Um, there's a few things we're going to cover uh, over the next however long. Um, I'll I will keep to time, I promise. Um, we're going to talk about building a rural makerspace and why the challenges of building a rural makerspace are ever so subtly and sometimes extremely different to what you might experience if you're setting up something like this in a major town or a city. Um, I'm not going to read the points on every slide. Um, we'll cover them vaguely and I'll try and keep roughly to the subjects as we go. But I am really good at getting distracted by my own content. So I will warn you, there will be diversions in this talk. But before we get started, where is Monmouth and who are we actually aiming for? This is Monmouth. This is the view of Monmouth from the top of a hill called the Kimin, um, just outside the town. It's surrounded by fields. It's only a 40 minute drive from here. Okay? It's in, on the Welsh-English border. It was, England, it was in England until the 1960s. Then it became Welsh. It makes six nations really, really interesting when you come for an England-Wales game in the rugby. I love it. As a town, we've got just over 10,000 people according to the census in 2021. Of those, 52% are female. That will become relevant later. 96.4% are white. We are not a diverse town. It's conservative leaning as far as its politics are concerned and that will also become relevant later. 47% of the population are aged over 50 and of the remaining 53%, 22% of those are aged under 19. Okay. That will also be relevant. So only 30% are actually aged between the ages of 20 and 49. We don't have a train station. The buses, even locally, run once an hour, if you're lucky. They start at half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning, and they're all done by half past four in the afternoon. Right? Public transport is not a thing where we live. I get angry about that, but I'll save that rant for another time. <coughs> We're right on the dual carriageway that links, if any of you came up from South Wales, or any of you came from anywhere north, really, if you come from the north, you will have come down the M50 to get here today, or yesterday, whenever you turned up. If you come from South Wales, you will have come up the A40 and the A449, and then onto the M50 to get here. We are on that dual carriageway that links the M50 with the M4, and therefore all traffic going from the north to South Wales, or from South Wales to the north of the UK, goes through Monmouth. That will also become relevant. What does the town do? Well, actually, it's tourism these days. Any of you that know your textiles history will, talk, will know of uh, Monmouth caps. And the town was actually famous originally for wool and textiles and things like that. Then they put in that dual carriageway, and when they did that, they decimated the docks all the way along the River Wye. We don't have any docks in Monmouth anymore. Um, if any of you are from Bristol, there's a pub in Bristol called the Landugger Trow. Uh, the, a trow is a particular type of boat for the Seven or, and for the Y that used to come up as far as Monmouth and then they put the dual carriageway in and all the trade stopped. So it's just tourism. There's a few services, there's a couple of industrial units, but otherwise, that's all it is. If we compare this to somewhere like Manchester, They've got 470,000 people instead of our 10,000 people. 50% of those are female, 53% are white as opposed to our 96. 68% of the population in Manchester is aged between 18 and 64. They have multiple train stations, they have universities, you've got Media City at Salford. There's a start-up scene, the list goes on and on and on. Why am I picking Manchester? Because actually, spaces like Hackman and East Essex, hey! <laughs> um, and East Essex and all these other places are where we want to be. But we've got to do it with far fewer people in a town that is far less adventurous when it comes to stuff going on. So how did it all get started? It was a geek in search of new friends. Guess who that geek was? <laughs> Hi. 
Um, this stat from the Welsh Government is incredible, right? 17% of the Welsh population report themselves as being lonely. All right? And most of those are actually the younger generations. They're not the older ones. All right? If anyone wants this, we've got, I'm renewing the, um, the documentation on the Make Monmouth website and all of this information will be up there. Of that 17%, I was one of them. Right? I moved here for reasons that uh, I won't bore you with too much, but effectively it was a good place for us to be to raise a family. But as you can tell from my accent, I'm not Welsh. You know? <laughs> I grew up down by Gatwick Airport. Right? <laughs> I'm about what, 300 miles away from where I, where I grew up. I'd already moved around quite a bit for various attempts at university. Again, long story, five attempts, still don't have a degree. Um, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll bore you with that another time. Um, but, um, but, yeah, so I've moved around a bit. But I still moved to Monmouth and realised that, okay, now I need to rebuild my entire friend network. Well, what do I do? I'm not really one for going down the pub. I had a very young family when we first moved up here. We've been here 16 years. My oldest daughter's 17. That gives you an idea of what the family was like at the time. Since then, we've had two more kids. And so, unless you're going to the pub, unless you're playing sport, things like that, right, Monmouth is not a place for blokes to socialise. Support networks for men, again, a whole other thing. I'll worry about those another time. I'm doing my best to stay on track, I promise. The other challenge that I had was that when I moved to Monmouth, I got a job on an industrial estate just outside Monmouth, working as a Linux support technician. I've been working in open source for nearly 25 years now, uh, which is a little bit scary, um, but, um, but there we are, we all have to acknowledge, acknowledge our age at some point. Um, and when I was at that job, it was a very, very small consultancy. Something happened with a client that wasn't my fault, but I couldn't prove that it wasn't my fault. So I found myself six months in to having moved up to Monmouth with no job. Now, we already know a lot about the demographics of Monmouth. Guess how many other IT consultancies there were in Monmouth 16 years ago? Very, very few. By which I mean none. So I had to take work elsewhere. The job I got was in Worcester. That meant I was leaving at 7 o'clock in the morning, getting home at 7 o'clock at night. Absolutely exhausted, walked through the door, immediately do things like helping my wife bath the kids, feed them, do the dinner, you know, all of that stuff. So there's no time to socialise, right? And then when I moved on from Worcester, I ended up in London during the week and home at weekends. Then I've gone to Bristol and Cardiff and then back to London and then Swindon and all over the place because you go where the money is, right? But it means there's very little time to socialise. Enough of the pity story. I put out a post on the local Facebook group saying, Hi, I'm a geek. Does anyone else want to meet up and also be a geek? I'll be in this bar. Monmouth has a disproportionately large number of bars and pubs on the high street, by the way, given the population, the number of people that actually live there. Anyway, I said, I'll be in this bar on this day, at this time, and I turned up with a laptop and a little toy penguin, because Linux... And I waited. And people actually turned up and they brought robots. <laughs> this robot's actually here today, by the way. Um, Dan, did you end up in here or not? No, he's disappeared off somewhere else. I don't blame him. I would have gone somewhere else as well. I've heard me talk before. And this robot is here. It's in Shonkbot, which is literally the other side of that canvas. Um, it has taken Dan a long time to build it, but it is awesome. And it turned up. And there were five or six of us sat in this bar in Monmouth with this robot being driven up and down the table. And everyone else was, what? <laughs> uh, it's completely foreign concept in. And some of those people that turned up have stayed with us. And they still come today. Some of them helped me, including Dan who built this, build the space. And I'll talk more about what we've ended up with in a bit. Um, and we continued to meet in the bar for a few months, but then we found a community hall that was just £5 an hour. 
And we thought, do you know what? This looks good. And here it is. It's an old shop. It wasn't used, it was used by a credit union, a health care agency, and the occasional afternoon tea for older people. And we were told we could have it twice a month in the evenings as long as we covered the cost of the rent. So 20 quid a month, do two hours, great. And that's where we hit our first problem and one we actually still struggle with today. Who here has ever tried to organise more than three people to be in a room at the same time when none of you are getting paid to be there? Right. You get a load of responses. You've got to go around the group. Finally, you agree, great, we'll do Wednesday nights. That works. Okay, what time? <sighs> okay, fine. We'll do eight till ten. Brilliant. We've agreed on a day, we've agreed on a time, and then someone gets a new job, which means they then can't make that, or they move away, or it clashes with a new family commitment they've got to take on and all the rest of it. So you say, okay, fine, well in that case we'll, we'll alternate it, we'll change the day and we'll alternate it, and we'll do the first Tuesday and the third Thursday. We did this. Don't. <laughs> so is that the first Thursday and the third Tuesday, or the first Tuesday and the third Thursday, and is that monthly or is it every other week? And are we still meeting at 8 o'clock? Do you know what? We're going to go back to one day of the week. So we go back to that. But by that point, everyone's commitments have changed. And so you're back to, okay, which day should we be using? Uh, and all the rest of it. And so, yeah. Eventually, you end up with a day that almost everyone can make. And then people say, oh yeah, but in the winter, 8 o'clock at night's too dark for me to walk home on my own. Can we bring it earlier in the day, please? And after you've gone off into the corner and had a quiet cry to yourself, you come back and say, yes, of course we can. Because what's more important is that people can turn up. Especially when you're in a town of 10,000 people, not a city of 47,000. If anyone has solved this problem... <laughs> Without just saying, do you know what, we're just going to open 24-7 and be done with it. I would love to hear how you've done it, genuinely, because we still can't afford to be open 24-7. We would love to be, but we really struggle. So we've got a venue, we've decided on a day and a time to meet up, but how do we know that things are actually working? Well, at this point we're a bunch of people turning up to a set space at a set time on a set date. We've got a petty cash tin, and as long as there's more than 10 quid in there at the end of the evening, we're covering our costs, we're done. Sorted. We've got 10 to 15 people coming down. We're in about 2018, 2019 here. Some of you already know what's coming. Um, and, you know, we've got enough people coming along on a regular basis that we're covering our costs, um, but I have had to take another job, so I'm in London during the week and back home at weekends, but other people are running it for me, and I'm realising how my important setting this up was to me how much of a difference it made to my own mental health. And I'm missing it, because I'm sat in a hotel in Swindon eating the same bloody thing off room service every single night, and I am sick of it. But we're covering the rent, people are happy, things are going well, we're working out how we're going to expand in the future. If I get a job back in the Monmouth area or working from home, which I now do, by the way, I work from home 100% of the time. Um, I work for a company called Grafana Labs, <coughs> Um, who do monitoring and all metrics and all the rest of it. We are hiring. I am not here representing Grafana Labs, but if anyone wants to talk to me about Grafana Labs, please come and find me afterwards. Um, anyway, I got the job back home, but this was this February 2020. We have to talk about this, right? I'm not going to dwell on COVID itself. We were all there. We lived through it. We knew what happened. We don't need a reminder of how bad it was. But it did mean that as a group we had to close our doors and we had to stop people from physically coming to the space. And we had to work out how do we continue, how do we get through this without losing momentum. I'll be blunt, we didn't. Right? We started off with Zoom calls, they were poorly attended. Am I surprised? No. What was everybody doing every single minute of the working day? They were on Zoom calls. The last thing you want to do in the evening after you've had eight hours of talking to colleagues that you probably didn't get on very well with in the office on a Zoom call where you then can't read their body language well enough to understand what they're saying is to be on another Zoom call. So it was fine. We did a few of those. They were okay. But they didn't really work. 
And then as restrictions started to lift, we managed a couple of socially distanced meetings, and then we were saying, okay, well, what about getting, you know, can we do this with fewer people in the space? Can we strip that? Because it's not a big room. I haven't shown you a photo of the inside, but it's, it's not even a third of the size of this tent. You know, it's probably closer to a quarter, if not less than that. In fact, actually, if you imagine a space that's about that big, that's probably about how big it is, right? Because everything else in Monmouth is really expensive. But we were determined to make it work, so we said, right, we need to come up with a plan. So we came up with some long-term goals. The venue, it works. We know where it is. It's cheap. We need a logo. None of us are particularly enamoured with this logo, but it's amazing what you can do in Adobe Online Logo Maker in the space of five minutes when you really can't be bothered and you don't have any money for a creative individual to do it properly. And then incorporation, right? We knew we needed to get funding, but four 40-something white blokes without a bank account is not a good pitch for a funding bid. Right? You don't tick any boxes. So we need to look at how do we solve that. So we'll talk a bit about this. What do you want to be? Uh, anyone that's in here that's on the uh, Hackspace owners group will know that I agonized about this for months. And I took advice from everyone and then ignored a lot of it, in fairness. And that has come back to bite me. Um, but you've really you've got two routes when you're going down what we do. So you've got a kick, community interest company. Um, you can definitely get income. The really nice thing about it is that you're a limited company. So you can pay your directors, you can pay employees if you want to. You don't have to. We don't. We're all volunteers. We run it as a not-for-profit. And then the other thing, but you're not subject to charity law. Charity law is really difficult to understand, right? <laughs> it's like really difficult. I don't even want to go near it. So, community interest company is great. Charities, however, it's all donation based, but you can claim gift aid on everything that's donated to you, right? That's effectively an extra 20%. There's all kinds of things that you can do as a charity that you can't do as a kick. There's certain funds you can't bid for as a kick that you can bid for as a charity, but there were four of us who had said, yeah, you know what, we want to get going on this. And so we chose the route of being a kick. There's a couple of issues that I will talk about this uh, on being a kick. If you're looking at going down the community interest company route, find an accountant and get advice from them. And find an accountant that has dealt with community interest companies before. Right? They don't like them. My wife is very, very close to qualifying as being an accountant. And she has looked through everything and gone, now I understand why it was so difficult for you to get an accountant. Part of that is because when it comes to your end of year and you start filing your paperwork, you actually have to file paperwork. Your corporation tax can go off to HMRC absolutely fine. You fill in the CT600 online, job done. Finished. Great. Thanks. Everything else has to be printed out. There's a form called a KIC 34, where you have to justify your existence and what you're doing for the benefit of the community, whether you're paying anyone, whether you've got any assets, whether you've sold any of those assets, all of that kind of stuff. That has to be printed out. Your end of year accounts need to be printed out. It needs to be put in the post with a check and sent off to company's house. Now, our bank is modern. We don't have checkbooks. <laughs> so now I need to go to the post office and get a postal order. They look at you really strangely when you ask for a postal order. I don't think it's something they do much anymore. But anyway, if anyone here is from company's house and would love to find a way to improve and enhance that system and perhaps move it into the 20th century, um, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, so there are issues with being a kick, but on the upside, as a result of being a community interest company instead of four blokes without a bank account, we've raised over £1,000 in funding from the local town council. We've been able to buy a 3D printer, a vinyl cutter, storage for tools, basic hand tools. We got a donation of a server from uh, the Edinburgh Remakery, who are again an amazing organisation, really recommend you check their stuff out. Um, and it's been fantastic for us. 
Right, I'm running short on time. I will keep going. This is also a problem. What should we be called? Now, it's kind of given away um, in part of the talk already. Um, we're called Make Monmouth. Why are we called Make Monmouth? Because we make things. <laughs> and we're based in Monmouth. It was good enough at the time, right? We actually started as Hack Monmouth. You remember I was talking about the age demographic and the fact we were conservative leaning? People thought we were being set up deliberately to steal money from their bank accounts. <laughs> so I had to change it to Make Monmouth um, so that people would, uh, people would understand what's going on. But also we're now at a point where people that are turning up are not coming from Monmouth. <laughs> So we're making things in Monmouth, but we've got one of, our co one of my co-directors lives the other side of the Forest of Dean. We've got one chap that comes down from near Malvern, which is about 20 minutes in the other direction from here, twice a month, just to be in the space. And it's amazing that he does, because it says two things. First of all, it says my idea that actually we should try and get more of a community built around this stuff in a rural area is working. All right? That's brilliant. It's not why I do it, but it's brilliant. All right? Secondly, Mank Monmouth is kind of starting to not be quite so relevant as a name. So we're going to worry about that at the time. But we've got a name, we're incorporated, we own the websites, we can bid for money, we've got the social media accounts, although I'm really rubbish at keeping those updated, but how do we make sure we can afford the rent? Well, we decided to offer different membership tiers. So everyone can come along once a month for the free night, and then you become a member and you can come along for the second night. Uh, and as a member, you get access to online learning and all sorts of other things. And this was going to be great. And three or four people signed up to that. We can cover our costs. It's not really how we want to grow. So we asked again, is this working? Well. People are turning up, we can afford to pay the rent, we're meeting the community benefit threshold, kind of. Are we working... Sustainability here, by the way, is about the company being sustainable, not environmental sustainability, right? Can we continue to survive without grant money? Can we continue to keep going purely self-funded? I can see the other card coming out. I'm, I'll speed up. But we'd forgotten something, and we had to apologise. We were so keen when we came out of COVID to get going again, we'd forgotten that actually, whilst we were four straight white blokes in our 40s building robots, and whilst the demographic of Monmouth suggests that most people are above a certain age, not everyone is. So we issued this apology. It's on our Facebook page. And we are determined to provide the makers, crafters, tinkerers and hackers of Monmouth and the surrounding areas with a safe space to create and access tools that would otherwise be out of reach, regardless of gender, gender identity, expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion or lack thereof, or technology choices. Right. This, again, is really important to what we do. And it's something I'd really caution you about, because, as I say, the reason we ended up having to issue this, this hurt. This really hurt to be in this situation where you suddenly realise, oh my God, we've made it for us. So when you are forming anything like this, anywhere, always take into account what your target audience would be. You don't want to be here. So let's look to the future then. We had a long think about it. And we decided we need to grow up. We now have aims and objectives. This is what I'm adding to the website at the moment. Helping tackle rural isolation is actually me putting my hand up and going, I'm lonely. I want to meet people in a pub in a rural area. Right? When I think back to it, that's why I did it. Because I was bored and lonely, and I was rural. I was isolated. There wasn't, I don't think there was a word for that 16 years ago, but there is now, and it's great, because that goes down really well on funding applications. We want to provide a safe space. 
right? We've got a number of members who are neurodiverse. We've got other members who are part of the LGBT community. Right? And there is nothing really like that in Monmouth that provides that safe space where people can come and just be. And we want to do that. We want to encourage the next generation. We've al I've already told you the stats on people. They are moving away as soon as they hit, hit university age. And they are not moving back to Monmouth until they retire. Right? There is a massive gap for people between 20 and retirement age in Monmouth of things to do. And we want to bridge that. But we want to encourage the kids at school to understand that maybe university isn't the right answer. Maybe you can go and build stuff and become an entrepreneur and ignore the apprentice and actually be successful. Right? And then finally, we want to enable this thriving creative community. The Y Valley is amazing for creative events, right? All the way down it. There's river festivals every year. There's open doors, all kinds of things. We want to be a much bigger part of that. And we want to do it not by creating installations, but by giving people access to tools they might not otherwise have. So how do we measure that? These are our targets for the year. We want to double the number of people that are paying us money because that's really important. We want to run more workshops. We want to increase the tools available. We want to form closer ties with other groups. I have got two minutes left, so I will rattle through these last couple of slides. We would love a space like this. This has been abandoned for four years now. They want to rent it out for £20,000 a year. I will happily rent it from them for £5 a year, but I'll make sure that's used 24-7. They won't talk to me. We talked to the local council, they've got a massive building that isn't being used as well. I said to them, can we pay you a peppercorn rent? They said, you can put in a tender to bid for it. I said, what, against everyone else? Forget it. And we had plans for that as well. That was more about the rejuvenation of the high street. So this is still the problem we have. Regular income. We've changed it. Everyone's first visit is free. Doesn't matter when they turn up, doesn't matter when we're open, right? After that, you want to come along, pay as you go. £2.50 a meeting, that's sorted. That means we know we can cover all of the costs for that meeting. And then we've still got the subscriptions if people want to subscribe. At some point, it will become cheaper to have a subscription than it is to do pay as you go. Yeah? And we set up a membership portal so people can come and register and set up their direct debits and all the rest of it. And we're engaging with the community and people are loving this idea of running a Mesh-tastic workshop. But it doesn't always work. We tried to run some, an event, a series of events called Make with Pride. We thought this is our chance, right, to prove that we are this inclusive space. It failed miserably. And the reason why, I've since found out, is because we are a conservative, right-leaning town and people are afraid to be openly gay in the town and to their parents and various other things, right? We're going to try again next year, though, and hopefully it'll be better. And we're doing citizen science. This is an air quality sensor. I mentioned we were on that dual carriageway. We have a huge number of issues with the pollution. Various governments are refusing to put in place air quality sensors, so we're doing it ourselves. So wrapping up then, what have I learned? First of all, this stuff is hard, right? It's like really hard. It's way more than one person can do on their own. So find other people to do it with you. I've got three other directors. They are absolutely brilliant, but all of us are volunteers. So we all have issues with our lives that get in the way. Just because you like doing a particular craft, like building robots, doesn't mean everyone else wants to do, build robots, right? So keep that in mind when you're ordering things. Next on the list for us, sewing machines, overlockers, all of that kind of stuff that isn't soldering irons and 3D printers. Yeah? It takes time to build this. And if you have a global pandemic, that will really put the brakes on. Unless you can get a grant for more than 50K, don't even try and get a space where you can open 24-7. Start gradually and build from there. And most of all, Try and, exhaust, try and enjoy it. It is exhausting, but it's absolutely worth it when you realise how much support you're actually giving people who would otherwise be unable to share all of their random product, the projects. There's a reason that we're here, all here at EMF, right? And it, it's not just because we all love camping. I've been Matt Wallace from Make Monmouth. Thank you very much for listening.